Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to give you some essay advice, some homework help on the play A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. So, how do we begin? Well, um, depending on what you want to focus on for A Doll's House, let me just say that you want to explore three different things when you're analyzing any of these, any of these classic plays. You want to explore character, you want to explore theme, and you want to explore historical or social context. So let's start with character, because I think that's the most obvious. With A Doll's House, we have our main character, Nora Helmer. So to explore an essay, if you wanted to focus on Nora, you would want to ask a question that you could explore further. And the question that I have, um, that you can borrow this question if you want to, uh, how does Nora perceive her husband and also, how does Nora perceive herself? Because I think when we, we try to figure out how does Nora feel about her husband, how does, she, how, how does she truly relate to him, or how does she ultimately feel disconnected from him, that helps us understand how we can interpret the play. So, I've brought a few props. I don't have an actual doll's house, but I do have Little's Pet Shop. So let's say that this is the home of Nora and Torvald Helmer. And let's make, um, let's make this, we'll make this Nora. So here we have Nora. We've got Nora Helmer, and she's living in her little pet shop house. And then we've got, we'll make this husky, this manly husky Torvald Helmer. So we've got Torvald Helmer living together, and they have three children, and they live in Norway in the late 1800s. Yes, what an amazing home the Helmers have. However, we learn very early on that things aren't quite right. Why? Well, because Nora is keeping a secret from her husband. That's right. Torvald Helmer got sick a while ago, and Nora forged some documents with her father's name, her dead father's name, so that poor little Torvald could go off to Italy and recover in the sunny weather. But Nora lies even more than that. When we see her at the very beginning of the play bringing Christmas presents in, we see her eating a little macaroon. And then when Torvald comes in and says, hey, have you been eating macaroons? She's like, uh, and she tells a fib. Now that fib might be harmless and innocent and maybe we can see that as just their, their relationship. I think that it shows that Nora has grown deceptive over the years. Now maybe she has a good reason to be deceptive. It depends on your opinion of her and the overall play. But one thing that's true is that Nora has been keeping secrets and covering them up. She's been covering her tracks. That's why she might seem greedy at the beginning of the play, because she's asking for money for a Christmas present. But then we learn that she wants to have more money so she can pay off her debt. But at the same time, we could argue that all of these deceptions are actually good deeds because this guy, this guy Torvald is very stubborn and he wouldn't have admitted that he was sick and he wouldn't want to, he wouldn't have wanted to borrow any money and so he would have just let himself die uh, and Nora would have been left all alone as a widow. Oh, that's sad. Now we could say that Nora is just keeping a very harmless secret. In fact, maybe it's a benevolent secret to preserve her husband's sense of honor. But then, oh, that sneaky lizard Krogstad comes in the situation and tells Nora, hey, I'm going to blackmail you. I know that you forged your father's signature. And she's like, no, no, yes, yes. And oh, so she is a, a classic damsel in distress at the beginning of the play. However, things change by the time we get to the middle portion. So the question that we have for Act 1 is, how does Nora really feel about her husband? She says that she loves him dearly. She also seems to believe that Torvald would sacrifice anything to, to save her, and that's something she doesn't want to have happen. So are these real beliefs that she believes to the core? Or is this sort of a facade? Does she deep down already know at the beginning of the play that Torvald is putting on airs and she's also putting on airs? Are they both building illusions? And do they know that they are building illusions? I would argue that Torvald, uh, Torvald 
is close-minded enough that he really believes what he is saying. However, I think that uh, our doll character, I think that Nora, uh, I think that deep down, Nora might know that Torvald isn't the man that she has believed him to be. And so much of the play is about how long can Nora continue to keep these facades? Uh, how long can Nora continue to have this deception, this self-deception about herself? Let me try to give you an example of what I mean. So we've got Nora. Now, if Nora's real conflict is that she just needs some money to pay off the debt with Krogstad, then, um, then the conflict could go away when Dr. Rank, <laughs> when Dr. Rank shows up in the middle of the play and says, hey, I'm, I'm dying, Nora. I'm, uh, and I just want something to, to, to leave behind in a positive way before I die. So Nora, at this time, all she needs to do is basically say, look, hey, I've, I'm in trouble. Don't make me explain why. I need you to write me a check for such and such a thousand crunks or francs or whatever they use in, in Norway. And, and then Dr. Rank, he, he, would, he would make it rain. He would give her the money and that's, 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 that would be the end of it. But before that can happen, Dr. Rank says something interesting. Dr. Rank basically says, hey, Nora, you don't think he's the only one, right? Uh, meaning that this idea of uh, our husky friend Torvald. Uh, Torvald, according to Dr. Rank, is not the only one that loves Nora so much that he would give up his life for her. Now, when Nora hears this, she changes. Right before Dr. Rank's confession, Nora's been very flirtatious. She's lowered the lights. She's even let him look at some stockings, some parts of the costume she's going to be wearing for the party. Uh, so why does Nora suddenly change? She's just in, just about to get what she wants and what she thinks that she needs. Uh, some money to pay off the IOU, and then she is free, and Torvald's not going to be finding out, and nobody needs to sacrifice themselves. So why, when Dr. Rank says, hey, he's not the only one who loves you, why does Nora shut things down? That's up for you to decide, but um, it might be one of the keys to understanding her character. Near the very end, Nora is very, very upset because Torvald has said, well, I'm going to go into my study and I, uh, good night, Nora, my little songbird, my little spinthrift, my little pet, my little squirrel, my little whatever. So he, he goes to look at the letters. And then this is when Nora, now Nora is getting ready to throw herself into the icy river. But before she runs out, she's putting on her, her coat and her hat and her scarf, and she's about to go out the door, and then Torvald comes in and says, Nora, what's the meaning of this? And she's like, oh. So this is where Nora's saying, oh, oh, Torvald, let me go, let me go, don't, don't hold me back. And Torvald's holding on to her, saying like, what, you know, don't be ridiculous. What are you talking about? What are you doing? You're going to tell me what has happened here. So this is where it dawns on Nora that Torvald is not going to rescue her. Torvald has just said in the scene before this, is like, oh, Nora, if you were ever in any real danger, you would see how deeply I love you. You would see how protected you are. You'd see what a, what a man I can be. And then the moment that he is touched upon with some kind of scandal where his honor is in jeopardy, he is ready to, to yell at her, to discredit her, to insult her in every way possible. He is telling her that they, they're still gonna live together, but they're not going, the marriage is just going to be a sham and he doesn't want her around the children. So he says all this, these really mean things. And so any illusion that Nora has had has been shattered. So the question though, uh, going back to what does she believe about herself? I'm curious what you think is Nora really prepared to sacrifice herself? Was she really about to run out into the, uh, the city and jump into the icy river to end her own life? Or was she waiting to see Torvald's reaction? Was she waiting to have proof that Torvald 
was either the man that he claimed to be or a facade. So when we answer some of those questions, that helps us decide how we should interpret Nora's decision. Nora, of course, decides to leave behind her children and she abandons the marriage. She goes out into the world. She slams the door behind her with very, very little chance of ever coming back into Torvald's life again. So that's a bold choice. And in fact, I wanted to tell you that if you're going to write about this play, you might want to learn a little bit about the history. This ending was so shocking to people that uh, when play companies in, outside of Norway, in other parts of Europe, when play companies said, hey, we, we heard Ibsen wrote a new play and it's a big hit in Oslo. We wanna, we wanna produce it. Send us the script. So Ibsen and his company sent the script. People read the script in Italy and Germany and they looked at it and was like, oh, we, we can't have this kind of ending. No way, audiences are not gonna stand for it. So they basically said they were gonna change the ending. Ibsen thought like, whoa, whoa, if someone's gonna change the ending, I'll change the ending. And Ibsen did not like doing this, but he wrote uh, a new ending. Torvald, I'm going. No, Nora, you can't leave. Well, I am. No, you can't. Wait, wait, Nora. How can you leave? Wait, Nora. How can you leave behind your children? And then Nora, seeing her children, breaks down and cries, oh, and the curtains close. So that alternate ending really changes the theme of the play to something that is basically supporting the status quo at the time. Characters and theme. You are looking to see what choices the characters make. You are trying to understand why the characters make those choices. Those choices lead to messages or lessons. Those are themes. And then the historical context, you can, my advice about putting in historical context, if you like history or if you like psychology or sociology, sprinkle some of the context in it. Learn about the, the play or learn about the society in which the play is written. I've included some links down below that give you a couple directions you can go as far as uh, exploring historical context. Remember, learning about the biography of the playwrights can be a very useful tool. And in the case of Ibsen, Ibsen actually knew a woman that and in the case of Ibsen, Ibsen knew a woman that was in a very similar situation to Nora. In fact, that was one of the chief inspirations of that. So I've included a link that lets you learn more about the historical context and the, the non-fictional sources that Ibsen used. I'm also including a link from a Norwegian website that talks a little bit about the history of feminism in Norway. One of the most common mistakes that students make when they are writing about a doll's house is that they overgeneralize the gender dynamics of the society. Uh, many students will write about a doll's house and they will say things like, oh yes, women like Nora had absolutely no rights at all. And while there's some truth to the lack of rights, uh, saying that they had no rights at all is not true. With this article I've included, you'll learn that in the 1800s, around 18, the 1830s and the 1840s, women did receive certain rights, uh, very limited rights, but certain rights so that they could trade, so that they could make a living, have an occupation. But you will find, if you read the article, that those rights were not necessarily given to the female citizens of Norway just out of a sense of altruism or equality. Uh, instead, the society was finding at the time that many unmarried women were becoming a burden on their fathers, and so they changed things so that women could make a little bit of money. So it wasn't so much about equality, it was that they didn't want the government or uh, burdened fathers to have to pay for these unmarried women. So I would definitely suggest looking into the biography of Ibsen, looking into uh, feminism in the 1800s in Europe in particular, in particular in Norway, and um, explore anything else within sociology, history, and psychology, and that will, um, that will help add to your analysis of the play. I hope that this has given you a few ideas and that uh, it's added clarity to the play. Uh, I'd like to thank my cast and crew for doing a good production. Yes, yes, give a round of applause. Yay, yay, bow. Yes, good job. Oh, yay, you did so great. Yay, yay. Bye, everybody.